guys got way of, of uh, determining whether or not the sound is good for you. Can y'all hear it? You can? Okay, all right. Uh, for those of you that are already listening in, thank y'all. So we're going to start at 1130. Right at, right at 11 35 Bible study. Um, I think some of you have been informed, or you at least got an email um, that Daniel's uh, outline laid out for you. If you want to use that outline uh, in our time of study for today, it'll be helpful for you. So, once again, thank y'all for, for tuning in. I don't know where you uh, are. Some of you at home, some of you at uh, maybe at work. Wherever you are, thank you so much for for listening in and uh, allowing us the privilege of being able to uh, to study with you today uh, as it uh, relates to the, the Word of God. Um, I have to be honest with you; I am so grateful for the opportunity that has uh, been presented to us. Um, I know in a lot of cases it's been very challenging for some people. I'm certainly praying for churches sometimes who don't have the access to the uh, technology as uh, we are enjoying. And of course, there are others that are just at a, at a level beyond, way beyond what we're doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I want to thank God, as I said, just for the chance, just to, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, to come into your homes, to be able to spend some time with you so that we can, uh, as a church, Again, those who are visiting with us, uh, thank y'all so much for, for listening in on, uh, on what we're doing. Um, if you know someone who may not be aware of the fact that we're on, uh, go ahead and call the, uh, have them call the conference line to let them know the Bible study is on. Uh, we're going to do that at 1130 this morning and again at 7 o'clock tonight. Uh, I want us to stay engaged as much as possible, uh, more than anything in the Word of God. So, uh, so please, by all means, uh, contact our elders, anyone you can think of. Um, and I know in some cases, some of you don't have believing friends or relatives. Uh, this is a good opportunity to uh, engage and allow them to be part of uh, studying the Word of God in a very, you know, very unassuming way. So, just encourage you to, uh, to, to do that. We're using two different uh, platforms today. Um, you got the Facebook Live that's going on. Uh, also, uh, there are those who are calling by way of the other conference call. And so I'm just going to say for those of you on the conference call right now, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Um, uh, so keep calling in. Um, I'm going to kind of give a beep that goes on, but it tells me that you're in, but you don't have to say your name, anything like that. Uh, but we want to just encourage you to uh, continue to call. We we'll definitely appreciate your, uh, your presence. Uh, on today. In one minute, uh, as we always do, try to be serious about time, um, and that's where we're going to be uh, going, doing, going forward as, as it relates to our, our study for today. I pray again that all of you are doing well, I, I do. Uh, I know again it's very, very a time of testing. We just got the new uh, edict from the, uh, the president that we're going to be doing what we're doing for sure until the end of April. Uh, so uh, I just want to encourage you uh, acclimate, adapt. Don't don't frustrate yourself about what you're not able to do, uh, what you used to do and can't do it anymore. Just put that out of your mind, and just you know, just just come with the thought that uh, I know this is what we we have to do right now. So we're gonna just always trust in God uh, that He is going to uh, to provide for us everything that uh, that we need. So again, I encourage you to continue to call in and to continue to inform. Members uh, and others who would listen in as to uh, what we're doing on today. As we always do, just based on our, our custom here, is that this particular day we often we start with prayer, and there are various ones that we are praying for. And uh, I would that you would just join with me just for a moment as we uh, we bow before God and uh, and lift up certain persons. This is our time of intercessory prayer uh, as it relates to the the, the the Good Shepherd family. So, Father God, we all love you and thank you so much for being the awesome God that you are. We thank you, God, for your love for us, your compassion toward us, your care. Uh, you have demonstrated to us, as uh, Pastor West said a few days ago, that our, our lives are literally in the palm of your hands. 
And so we thank you, God, for the other recognition that you are God and that you're God alone. We are reminded in uh, Psalm 115 that you are in heaven and you do as you please. And so we are grateful uh, to know that uh, we are living under your pleasure, under your power, under your presence, and underneath your provision. So I pray today, uh, as uh, lift up Sister Betty Savannah, uh, God, you know, she was in the nursing home, then went to the hospital, and now she's back uh, in the hospital. Uh, and God, we pray that you would uh, deliver her as only, as only you can. Uh, that COPD that she is dealing with, the inability to breathe, and they are, think she's developed pneumonia. God, we ask for healing in her body. And not only that, we do pray for Greta, we pray for Marvin. Members of our church who are concerned about their mom and their sister, respectively. And we ask again your grace and your mercy uh, continue to be upon them. Certainly pray for Reverend uh, Cornelius Williams uh, uh, in Lake Charles, Louisiana, who did contract the, uh, the virus. And we just thank you, God, that healing is on the way, that he's doing better, that he's getting better daily. And we just pray you continue to, uh, to heal his body. The Lord, we, we find it that there it gets closer and closer to people that we didn't know hearing about them, but now we hear about people that we do know. And so we ask again that you continue to heal their body. We certainly pray for Miss Almira, uh, Sister Phil, Sister Chandler, uh, Brother Callahan and his family, his wife, who is going through a season of difficulty. We just ask again for healing in her body, in her mind, God, you know, the issues with her eyes. We just ask God that you would just keep uh, as only you are able, Father. We pray again for those who are at home and some ways frustrated by the fact that they can't move around and do things that they normally used to do. I just ask God that you would grant comfort to their hearts and their souls and, and help them to know again that you said you would never leave nor would you ever forsake and help us again to, uh, to live in that in the comfort of that reality. Uh, once again, for all of our members who are sick and afflicted, uh, the elderly, those that are young, we just ask you continue to, uh, to meet the needs of that life. God, give comfort as only you can give comfort. Peace is only you can give peace. Console is only you can console. And then Lord, I pray for our frontliners in the medical field who are members of our congregation, Eric and Tarankula, uh, Lucretia, Deborah, Fiesta, uh, Carmen, Rita. We just ask that you would just continue to bless them. Those who are in law enforcement, uh, Daniel Tate in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Keith Harris, who is a uh, Father Marshall, we just pray, God, as they are going through these uh, moments of dealing with our public, that you would protect them and you would provide for them. We not only pray for them, but we pray for every person uh, in the medical field who are dealing with having to care about others. God, that you would comfort as only as only you are able, Lord. Uh, and then again, for those who are infected, we pray for those families. We pray for strength. We pray for healing, God. We know you got miraculous healing. We clearly know that you can do that. So we pray for miraculous healing. Uh, Lord, if you choose not to do it that way, we pray for a medical cure because we know you have that power. And then we pray for medical personnel protection uh, because, God, we know only you uh, is dem demonstrating that you got the power to handle this situation. So bless us now in our time together as we study your word. We pray again that you will be glorified in what we say and do on this day. It's in Christ's name we pray and we pray for his sake. Amen. Uh, I'm delighted today uh, to again once to, 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 uh, to share with you all in this particular setting as we uh, go through this, uh, this study. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. That's going to be our focal passage uh, for today. Uh, we are currently reading through, as the church knows, uh, we're reading through the, uh, the book of Matthew, and I think today was an appropriate time. This is uh, Matthew 17 on this particular day. That's what we ought to be reading. So if you haven't read it, to, this is uh, your opportunity today uh, to catch up as to, uh, to where we are. And so just for edification, I want to start off by reading the passage. Um, let me say this. I'm, I'm in this setting right now, sitting the way I am today. Uh, first pastor here of Good Shepherd, uh, Pastor Emil Johnson. This is how he used to teach us. Uh, we used to come out uh, on Wednesday night, what was called uh, uh, the teacher's meeting. And, uh, and this is how he would sit 
uh, to teach the word, and I think it's something that uh, his son Timothy Martin Johnson uh, practices uh, on, a, on a, every now and then as it relates to the uh, the men's Sunday school class. And so I just figured this was just a unique way of uh, in, encapsulating or capturing, if you would, kind of the history of our church, uh, looking at the way Reverend Johnson did it. Matthew chapter 17. Um, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led him up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make one here for Three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and they were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And they lifted up their eyes. They saw no one but Jesus only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the visions to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Just again, just by way of tagging the text, just to kind of uh, give us an idea of what we want to talk about today. And it's a simple message. Hear him. So if you have your outline, uh, those of you that are following by way of outline, uh, you can be looking at that just as a, as a resource for you to, to study going forward. Um, I have the utmost respect uh, for all three of my pastors, uh, Pastor Wilson, uh, Pastor M.L. Johnson here in Houston. Uh, but my first pastor was, was Dr. M.L. Thomas. And through God's providence, my first pastor, Dr. M.L. Thomas, uh, was also my last pastor until his uh, death uh, this last year in October. As a child, he was a giant of a man to me. When I became a preacher, Marcy and I had the opportunity to get close to him and Sister Annie Thomas, who actually had a birthday on uh, on yesterday, and we started praying for her uh, from from about 1964 until uh, about 1988. I viewed him as stern and serious. Yeah, he was very kind, very kind. Uh, later, uh, we discovered that, that though he was quite serious, we also got to know. Uh, that he had a wonderful sense of humor, uh, just wonderful. All of those characteristics made him the man he was. However, we never would have known that if he had not allowed us to get close to him. Uh, so in Jesus' early ministry to his disciples, he pro progressively revealed himself. He allowed them uh, to be close so that he could fully, they could fully recognize who he was. Uh, Matthew 17 stands out because uh, his original followers, as well as believers today, got a glimpse into the totality of his being. He stood out in such a way that God the Father commanded that we must hear him. Now, in order for uh, Matthew 17 to make sense to you, it's important to go just to take a little trip back to Matthew 16, uh, because when you recall Peter's previous statement in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Uh, no, it was God who revealed it in verse 17. So now, to further substantiate the truth that God, uh, that, that truth, God transfigured Jesus before Peter, James, and John. And notice again, let's just go back to chapter 16 for just a moment. We start at verse 13. It says, and when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, that was important in terms of where Jesus was located. Caesarea Philippi was considered a from a from a pagan standpoint, from the Jew, from a Roman standpoint, uh, from a Greek standpoint, it was actually considered the gate of Pan, and and Pan was uh, in the sense of god of death, and so 
Uh, so Jesus strategically puts his disciples right in front of uh, the mountain of Caesarea Philippi. And then he asked the question, he asked them saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some uh, others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And you know, in reality, it's probably one of the most important I, you know, I feel sometimes it's the most important question that you can actually look at in the Bible uh, because all of us have to answer that question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because he was a real character. He was a real person. He lived on planet Earth. He did exist. And so therefore, it's important to ask that question in terms of who he is. So now uh, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 16, uh, I'm reading verse uh, 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 15 right now, or 16 right now. Simon, Simon Peter said to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now notice the answer in verse 17, or if you would, the magnification in verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon or Jonah, Simon son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus says in verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, meaning again the Petra, you are Peter the small stone, and on this rock, the Petros, if you would, he says, I am going to build my church. Actually, the, the reversal is there. He says, I am going to build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So Jesus is establishing, and God is establishing through his Son that the church is built on the fact that God chose to reveal, he chose to reveal that Jesus absolutely is the Christ, the son of the living God. He is the Messiah that the Jews expected. He's the Messiah that the Jews were trusting that would uh, come, that they were, were, were hoping that would come. And here he was in flesh and blood. And based on the revelation that God gave to Peter, he is now saying, he is now saying, flesh and blood, blood didn't reveal that to you. So what am I going to do on the basis of this revelation that, I, that has been given by my Father to you? That's what I'm going to build my church on. And I'm going to build the church on the reality that you will always declare that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And listen, folks, for those of you who have trusted him today, you ought to praise God. You ought to just be thankful that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a believer in God. So now, when we come to chapter 17, God is now expanding, if you will, on what was revealed about Jesus in chapter 16. So when we look at the, uh, the if you got it, if you have the outline, uh, some of you already have been given the outline, came up by way of email. And if you haven't gotten it, we're going to see to it some kind of way. We've got to find a way to make sure that everybody does get it on a, on a weekly basis. Um, but, but if you're looking at the outline, the first thing that we're looking at is, is that Jesus allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him. Now, the reason I start off by saying Jesus, remember, we're reading the gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's the gospel of Jesus according to Matthew. So what I always believe is that when we look at a narrative, we look at a narrative about Jesus, the subject is not about Peter and John. The subject is not about um, uh, anybody else. The subject is about Jesus. Jesus is the subject. So when we look at a narrative in terms of the gospel, Jesus is the primary focus. He is the hero. He is the the, uh, the, pro, the, the, the protagonist of this narrative, of the story. So anytime we study the Gospels, it ought to more so reflect what Jesus is doing and how Jesus is dealing with humanity, not what humanity is doing and how Jesus responds to humanity. No, it's what Jesus is doing and how in positioning himself, he actually causes humanity to respond to him in a certain way. So you got the Pharisees who they, they pro, they, they're the antagonists, they don't like him. You got his disciples who are his followers. You got people who meet him, people that were, that, that were even healed by him. And so Jesus comes now and he, he allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him. How do we know that? Notice again, verse one, it says, now after six, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, meaning six days after he was there at Caesarea Philippi, revealing that upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. He says uh, to Peter, James, and John, his brother, they led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And notice what happened in verse two. And he was transfigured. 
Notice what it says. He was transfigured. It doesn't say he transfigured himself. It says that he was transfigured again, which the idea was in a, in a sense a passive, meaning that he allowed himself because everything that Jesus did was dependent upon the Father. Jesus never did anything on his own. He never did anything independent of what the Father wanted from. So he allowed he allowed himself uh, to be re, to be to be. Re, he allowed, I'm sorry, he allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him. And notice how we have all of these characters that are involved. And look at how it interchanges, how it all works together. In verse 1 and 2, there was a visible change in Jesus. Notice again the first thing. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Ooh -wee. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Good job, you know, I always tell y'all, don't be reading this like this stuff happen every day. Don't be acting like, oh, you know, I see this every day. I see Jesus just, no, 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 no. We ought to be fascinated by this. We ought to be amazed by this. We ought to praise God. We ought to applaud this because we're reading about someone who is totally different than anybody else that we know. And so the Bible says his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. He was being glorified by the Father before their very eyes. And so what happens now? That was also the visiting company from the Old Testament. Verse 3, no, no, notice what goes on. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Oh my goodness. Moses and Elijah appeared with him talking with him. And so, and so now this is a vision that Peter and John are there able to see. They're witnessing it, but the only reason they can witness it is because they were in the presence of Jesus. Jesus has allowed them to come close enough to him that he would show them his glory. He would show them, uh, show himself off in a way that he never has. And now he has these guys who are there, uh, Moses and Elijah. Moses is considered one of the greatest prophets, you know, perform miracles and the like. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets, perform miracles. Uh, and preached to the uh, the children of Israel for very many, for many many years, and so here they were in the very presence of Jesus, and and Peter, James, and John are allowed to see. That was not only the visiting company from the Old Testament. We look at verse four. It says that was the vocal confusion on the part of Peter. Notice verse four. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good. I, I want you to just think about this. He's nervous now. He is just a nervous wreck. He is he's just as nervous as he can be. He said, Lord, Lord, uh, it is good for us to be here. Uh, if you wish, let us make let's make it three tabernacles. One for you, uh, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He is nervous. And and actually, when you read uh, the book of Mark, uh, chapter 9, verse 6, and it actually said that Peter just didn't know what to say. He was so overwhelmed by what he saw, so excited by what he saw, that he is literally is talking, but he's, I mean, why are you going to build tabernacles for some, somebody who's not staying? I mean, this is just a vision that he's seeing, but he is just overwhelmed and excited. And I still say that's the same thing. Every time we come to the Word of God, every, think, every time we think about Jesus, that ought to be, it ought to resonate some excitement about us because what we discover, that there's nobody who can do what Jesus does. There's nobody who has ever lived that has been as fascinating and worthy of praise like Jesus Christ. In chapter 5, that was the verbal verification of the Son by the Father. Notice what happened in verse 5. And it says, while Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Notice, hear him. I love that, y'all. I love that. I love that. I'm telling y'all, good shepherd, you need to get excited right now. Don't be reading this like this is something you see every day. No, 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 no. Here Peter is talking. Peter is, is excited. He's nervous. He's talking about building tabernacles so that they can dwell in those tabernacles and stay in all of that it because he just don't know what to say. But the Bible says, the Bible says that while he was yet talking, a voice from God, the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know about our Lord? That when he comes in his earthly ministry, he totally pleased the Father. That is great to hear, y'all. That's just, it's just, you know, again, it just reminds us just how worthy he is of praise and honor and obedience. Because the goal now 
was to do what? To hear him. And that's what we're talking about. It's important to hear him. Why? Because he is the only one that God has ever glorified in the way that he glorified his son. And then finally, when we get in verse 6, is the veneration or there's the reverence, there's the respect, there's the recognition of the son and the father by the disciples. Listen, what, look, notice what they do in verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Duh! I believe that one. I believe that one. They were greatly afraid. They here they are. Jesus now is shining. He is his clothes are bright as he can be. And now a cloud overshadows them. Elijah and Moses are in the presence talking with him. And then as all of that is going on, on top of that, God speaks. And now they are in fear. They are in wonder. They are in amazement. And listen to what I'm saying, folks. Don't ever lose that fear. Don't ever lose that amazement. Don't ever lose that wonder about Jesus. Don't ever be and don't ever fail to be in awe of just how great and awesome he truly is. So Jesus allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him. And then secondly, here's what he did. Jesus addressed the disciples in light of what was revealed of him. Notice what he did in verse 7. He came close enough to comfort them. I love that. But Jesus came and touched them and said, arise and do not be afraid. That's a good lesson for us right there. Notice what the previous verse said, that they were afraid, but they were afraid from the standpoint of their amazement of what the Lord had done. But notice he came close enough. He came close enough. Somebody last night went to bed afraid. Somebody went, went to bed scared. Somebody might be in fear right now that could be listening to us. But here's what a, a lesson that you, you have there. It helps us to know that he understands our fear. And the word is saying to us that he comes close enough to us to give us what? A word of comfort, uh, to let us know that everything is going to be cool, everything is going to be all right. But Jesus came and touched them and said, arise, do not be afraid. Hear him. I'm telling you, hear him. He is still saying to you and I, do not be afraid afraid. I know it's a lot going on in our world right now, but this word ought to resonate with us. That same Lord that was existing with Peter, James, and John on that mountain is the same Lord who lives in us today, and he is saying to you right now, hear him. And listen to what he says. Be not afraid. Notice again what he says. And then he calls them to see that no one compared to him. Notice, notice. Verse, verse 8. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Oh, my goodness. You can imagine the excitement that they had to see Jesus, Moses, Elijah. Hear the voice of God. He had all of that going on. But God is revealing who his son is. He's already said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So hear him. So when the smoke clears, when, when the cloud leaves, uh, when Elijah, Moses are gone, the only one that was there was Jesus. And listen, folks, here's the reality. A good, again, lesson for us. Everything else around us eventually is not going to be. Everybody else, if we live long enough, is not going to be. But the one person that we can count on, the one person that we know is always going to be there, is always going to be Jesus. So when the smoke cleared, when the clouds lifted, when the voice stopped being heard, the only person they saw was Jesus. And right now, my encouragement to us is to look to nobody else but Jesus. That's really what I wanted to say to you. Hear him. Look to Jesus, no matter what may be going on in your life. Verse number nine, it says, he commanded them to keep that revelation until after his resurrection. I just love the way Jesus says things. Look at verse nine. It says, now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one, but notice the language, until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. I just love that. I mean, he just he just got that in there kind of quick, you know. Uh, don't tell what you saw until the Son of Man. Is. So he's letting them know that yes, yes, we, we're here right now, but he's given an indication. Suffering is on the way, pain is on the way, but but all you talk about celebration and jubilation. That is absolutely on the way. Isn't that what we're getting ready for? Yeah, I want to encourage us. Listen, not going to do Easter like we used to do it. Won't be the fancy clothes. Won't be the, the music. Won't be 
church like we used to have it. But at the end of the day, the reality is we celebrate the fact that it was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And nothing, y'all, could be better than that. So Jesus just said very calmly, um, um, uh, tell, don't tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And of course, you know, we read 1 John. John reminds us that he says, oh, no, we saw him, we touched him, we heard him, we handled him, the very word of truth. And so, but they didn't say what they saw until the Bible says that they saw him on the mountain. Peter talked about it in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, we saw his glory on the mountain. And now they are, they, they've gone now uh, from that point on to explain to us this revelation that they saw. But the reality is that he is throwing in the fact that he is going to be risen from the dead. And here's the final thing to share with you as it relates to the outline. We talked about Jesus allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him. Jesus addressed his disciples in light of what was revealed of him. And here's the last one. Jesus affirmed with great proof what was revealed about him. So look at what he did. He consented with the scribes about the coming of Elijah. Look at verse 10 and verse 11. This is important. And his disciples asked him, saying, why then do the, the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Well, Jesus replies in verse 11, and Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. Now, now what's important about that is that, is that what, what he's talking about is the scribes, again, the scribes of the, of the Pharisees, the scribes of the Sadducees, these were the people uh, who, the lawyers who would study the law, interpret the law, if you would. They're saying now, Elijah must come first. Now, what has just happened? They just saw Elijah on the mountain. And so in their mind, they're thinking, okay, if, if the script describes are saying that Elijah must come first, well, it must mean now Messiah must be coming because we just saw Elijah. So now Jesus got to get them straight. So look, notice what he does in verse 9, uh, in, verse, in verse 12. And so, so he cleared that confusion about Elijah based on who? On John the Baptist. And look at how Jesus got, got them straight. Because they're looking at Elijah from the Old Testament and saying, okay, now, now that Elijah, we've seen Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, or, or in, when Jesus was transfigured, we now got to anticipate the Messiah. Hold up, hold up. You can't be waiting for the Messiah to come because Jesus is explaining it. Elijah has already come. How do we know that? How do we know that? Look at verse 12. He says, but I say to you that Elijah has come already. What? And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. The very scribes who should have known who Messiah was, who should have known that Jesus had come as the anointed one of, of, of Psalm 2. They should have known that beyond the shadow of a doubt because all the evidence was there. The miracles, the message, everything that he was doing was proof that he was the Messiah that God had promised. But they rejected him. They didn't believe in him. And not only did they not believe in him, but they even disregarded John the Baptist. You remember when John came preaching, uh, one of the things that this Bible says that when he goes into the river of Jordan, you read that in, in Matthew chapter 3, he would refer to them what, as brood of vipers. You know, uh, you know who warned you? To, uh, you know, that, that, that the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. But what did they do? They rejected John the Baptist, even to the point that when, when Herodias, uh, when Herod was on, on the, on the uh, Philip was on the uh, the throne, uh, he had his, his wife, uh, the woman that he should not have married. And John the Baptist spoke to that. And what happened to John the Baptist as a result? He was beheaded. So now he's already laying out what was prophesied in Malachi chapter 4 had already happened. So it was further validation that Jesus was the Messiah because John the Baptist had already come as a messenger like Elijah to say to them, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But they rejected him just like they did every other prophet. They killed all the other prophets who would prophesy in the name of God in terms of what God wanted them to do. So Jesus, there's a further validation that he is Messiah because John the Baptist is like Elijah who has already come. But what did they do? They rejected him. And notice again, verse 13, that must understand, it says, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. 
So now they get it. Elijah has already come in the form of John the Baptist. So it's evidence again. Jesus has to be the Messiah. He has to be the one that God will say, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He has to be the one that he's declared himself upon this rock, the revelation of my father. I am going to build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Final thing. He concluded that like John, he would also suffer. Look at the end of verse 12. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Well, this is what this season that we're getting ready to come into. Next week, uh, next Sunday, we're going to be calling that, you know, we'll be looking at that as, as Palm Sunday when Jesus made his triumphal entry. And so we're into that season. And folk, you good shepherd, you all know, this is my favorite time of the year. I, I, I promise when we can talk about Jesus the way that we can, when we can reflect on his life, we can reflect on his death, his burial, and ultimately what we're going to be celebrating on the second Sunday is his resurrection. I am so, I am so serious. Whether or not we can be in a building or not is not the matter. Whether or not we can all be together is not the matter. We can still celebrate the fact that we serve a risen Savior and he's in the world today. We know that he is living. We don't care what nobody else say. We see his hand of mercy. We hear his voice of cheer. And every time we meet him, he's always there. I'm telling you, he lives, y'all. And we got to believe that beyond the shadow of a doubt. And so here's what I'm saying to you, practically speaking. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. I challenge us to stop listening to ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, Fox, or whatever your preference uh, may be so much. I'm not saying don't listen. But I, I want to encourage you, don't listen to them so much. Can I, can I just say it that way? Uh, uh, but here's what I want to want to say. Uh, for at least one hour in the days that are yet to come, before this, you know, the virus goes away and all of that, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, uh, don't listen to the talking heads of the world. Don't listen to what the world is saying about what's going on and what's happening. Don't listen to that exclusively because some of you are driving yourselves crazy. Too much CNN, too much Fox News, Fox News, too much NBC. I'm saying to you, and I want to challenge you to do that now, is to hear him. So here's one more thing. Right now, right now, uh, if you would turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, if you can, turn to your Bible. And I'm going to read it for all of us, for those who can't read it. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, and he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So here's my personal challenge for us. I know some of y'all going to do it. Some of y'all going to say, no, Pastor, I just, I just can't do that. But here is what I'm saying. Here is a personal challenge. Turn off your digital devices. Pick up your paper copy. And I know some cases, y'all paper copy is dusty. Y'all haven't used that Bible in a long time since y'all got the, you know, your phones and your, your pads and all of that. I'm saying put that down because it doesn't even give you an opportunity to, to, to go to Facebook to check out what's the latest. It doesn't give you the opportunity to check out CNN. It doesn't give you the opportunity to do anything else. I'm saying pull out a paper bike. I'm talking about the old fashioned way, the old school way, the way, the way we used to do it about two years ago. Just use that and here's what I want to encourage you to do. Open it up and read the word of God because at the end of the day, what we got to do is hear him because what he has to say is more important. What he has to say is more significant. What he has to say is more profound. What he has, what he has to say is more encouraging. What he has to say will help us more than what anybody else has to say. Can I get a witness in here? Listen, folks. Thank y'all so much for listening in today as you have. Uh, I look forward to hearing from, uh, share with many of you again on tonight. I don't know if we'll do this passage or maybe just kind of go through Matthew 17 just a little bit further to finish it off. But until then, my prayer is that God uh, continue to bless and keep all of us. Listen, I love you. I love you with the love of Jesus. And I pray that God will continue to strengthen us. Father, thank you so much 
just for this opportunity to uh, share together in your word. And I pray, God, that as we move forward, you would make it a part of our regime, make it a part of our, our regular day that we would hear him, namely your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for him. We bless you for him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.